Mr. Blank, uh, uh, to start with, tell us uh, about your uh, latest book and uh, uh, why should uh, an entrepreneur buy it? Yeah. So the, my latest book is the Startup Owner's Manual, and the Startup Owner's Manual is a desktop reference. It's not a book. It's actually kind of an encyclopedia of all the things an entrepreneur needs to know how to do to build a successful company. Um, and uh, one of the things we've learned over the last 10 years is that we've gotten startups wrong. Startups are not smaller versions of large companies. Um, there's plenty of tools and books and manuals for uh, companies. That is, if I'm a large company or from Google or Facebook and I want to learn how to launch the next product, plenty of those books. But there are very few books that talk about the first year or two when startups are actually searching for a business model. Mm -hmm. And this book fits right into that category. What do I do the day I get started? Mm -hmm. Uh, what's in the book? Uh, is it how is it structured? Is it uh, case studies? Is it uh, n number of tools? Is it a set of practices and rules? Yeah. So the the mm. book is all about the search for the business model, and that really brings up a, two interesting things: is what the heck is a business model, and brings us even earlier to, to, to be honest, what's a startup? Um, and and uh, uh, for, out of first principles, I had to define for myself. And then for other entrepreneurs, what's a startup? A startup is a temporary organization designed to search for a repeatable and scalable business model. And that's kind of an interesting definition because the first thing you encounter is the word temporary. It means there is no such thing as a 10-year-old startup. There's a 2-year-old startup attached to an 8-year-old failure. The goal of a startup is to be a company, not to stay as a startup. And the next word you encounter is search. What the heck is that? I thought my job is to build the product or sell the product. It turns out, no, those are just parts of the things you need to do. You need to build the product, you need to sell it, you need to understand customers and pricing and partners and channels. And all that is actually what the business model is about. And so the book combines defining what a business model is and how to articulate your hypotheses about the model and then how to search. And that search process is called customer development. Mm -hmm. And the customer development process is fairly detailed. How do I first articulate my hypotheses? How do I then test the problem I think customers have or the need? And then how do I test my solution? That is, what service or product I'm offering. And then how do I get early orders before I scale? And so the whole purpose of the book is built around this customer development business model mm -hmm. canvas idea, which says we now have cracked the code for entrepreneurship. It's not about war stories. It's not about doing what large companies did. We are doing something unique in the early stages of a venture, mm -hmm. and this book tells you what it is. All right, uh, that that's cool. Uh, let's say I'm an entrepreneur uh, somewhere in the middle of Russia. Uh, I bought the book. Uh, I'm doing a, 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 a minimal viable product yeah. in some software as a service uh, okay, thing. There we go. You're using uh, the right words already. Uh, so the question is. Uh, how can I apply uh, what's in the book uh, uh, without being close to a customer, without having the real conversation? Like, uh, do you think is it is it something that you would advise to do? Uh, or yeah, so one of the mistakes, particularly when I traveled to Russia, is um, one it was just great to see capitalism uh, in, in Russia, but to, but two is um, entrepreneurs seem to have uh, a fundraising ment mentality that said. Here's my idea, now give me $50,000, please. Uh, th that's not entrepreneurship. I don't know what that is, but that's not how you do a business. You start with your idea, but to be honest, uh, my dog has ideas, but my dog isn't raising money. Uh, and, and, and I use that to point out the goal is not to have an idea and raise money. The goal is to first test whether your idea is valid at all. And by validation, I mean, does anybody care other than you and your roommate? And before anybody cares, Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, before you raise money, you need to prove to yourself and others that somebody other than you cares. And by cares, we mean, do they have a problem that people will pay for, or do they have a need? Uh, social networks satisfy emotional needs. Um, uh, accounting packages so solve problems, right? Problem or need. Mm -hmm. In either case, you've written some code, but who cared? Mm -hmm. and, and so before I would go out and raise money, I'd be trying to understand uh, you know, are there customers for this? Mm -hmm.
let's say for an entrepreneur who is in Russia and uh, let's say they're not raising money right now, um, what are the things that they cannot do or limited in doing uh, uh, compared with an entrepreneur who is here? Well, I think the biggest thing is cultural uh, rather than uh, physical. Um, that is, uh, in, in, in the United States, we're learning to what I call get out of the building. That is, get out of our own comfort zone and stop talking to each other and try to get early feedback as early as possible for customers. Mm -hmm. This really is a cultural issue because uh, somehow in some countries, in some cultures, it's, well, I'm the smartest person in the room, therefore I don't need to ask anybody. And there's an intellectual arrogance mm -hmm. of, about, well, if I built it, I was smart enough, and therefore <laughs> people would just line up around my building, and I could just be figuring out where the dacha goes um, <laughs> later. And, and, and uh, it doesn't work like that. It doesn't even work like that in the U.S. At first, it is a mental change. The mental change says the smarter you are, the more likely that you're wrong. That's a big idea. The more likely that you're wrong, because you will sit in your office and code away and think, well, I'll just have to figure out where to put the bag of rubles um, you know, when people line up. It, it doesn't work like that. Um, and, and so the first one is kind of bringing down the barrier of how smart you are and assuming that perhaps I ought to get other people to tell me how smart I am. Mm -hmm. And by how smart I am really is, I want this product, or I can't wait till you finish it, mm -hmm. or holy cow, this is the right track. And so I think the biggest problem really is, and, and again, we have it in, here in the States, but we're now learning to stop thinking how smart we are mm -hmm. and think that the people who actually write us checks or use the product okay. are, are the ones who are smart. Uh, well, another uh, area that, mm, that I think mm, be interesting to get a comment on, uh, uh, I think the Russian uh, entrepreneurs that, are the, that have Russian background, especially those that live in Russia, uh, have so much, uh, uh, like, I'm building a company uh, with all the company elements right. like hierarchy. Can you comment on that? Yes. So one of the things we have learned here is not to confuse search with execution. It's a key words, two key words. Execution are what existing companies do. What do they do? They build organization charts and there's the president and there's the vice president. And here you are. They have product management people. They hire salespeople. They hire marketing people. This whole organization assumes one big thing. It assumes you know what you're doing, right? And it assumes, no, it's no joke. It assumes not only do you know what you're doing, it assumes you know so much what you're doing that you're ready to burn money to go hire those people, put those organizations in place, and build a company. Now, eventually, you do want to do that. The big idea about customer development and this whole business model canvas says, perhaps we ought to verify that we're ready to go do that first. Well, I wrote the plan, and here's my slide, and here's my code. Of course, I need to do a company. That's wrong. That's going to put you out of business. That's going to make you fail very early. Mm -hmm. The first thing you need to assume is while I'm passionate and I have a vision, the odds are you're probably wrong. This is a big idea. Most startups fail. And in fact, most startups go from failure to failure inside the company until they're smart enough to listen and go, oh, the customers are asking for this. Or wait a minute, the customers aren't men 18 to 25. They're women in, you know, in Siberia over here who are bored. Oh, wait a minute. Or maybe the pricing shouldn't be freemium because I could never get them to upgrade. Maybe I should have a subscription model. You won't f have a company until you go through those iterations. Almost no company, none, get their initial idea right and that's what it ends up is. They typically go from, from almost jumping from ice flow to ice flow mm -hmm. on the frozen river uh, until they get to the end. Most of them fall in. Most startups do not succeed. 90% in Silicon Valley, after we've done this for 50 years, 90% or more fail. It's a big idea. Even the venture-backed companies who um, venture capitalists understand how to pick winners, over 90% fail. And here's the big message. Almost none of them fail because of the technology. Right? It's not because you didn't code enough. Right? It's in fact, it's that you probably coded too much and you didn't listen. Oh, I'll add, every, I'll add more features. That's not the problem, right? Mm -hmm. Twitter isn't about all the features, right? The iPhone isn't about every possible feature you could have packed into that device. It's about an astute understanding about the match between 
product, what we call value proposition, and customer mm -hmm. segment. And those two are what are called the product market fit. Mm -hmm. And those are just two of the many things that you need to understand. And the Startup Owner's Manual, back to the book, mm -hmm. actually gives you kind of this step-by-step he, oh, wait a minute, I'm supposed to worry about channel? Yes. Oh, am I supposed to worry about pricing? Yes. Oh, am I supposed to worry about customers? Yes, yes, and yes. Does, does this help? Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. Uh, uh, I know that you've been uh, uh, collaborating with uh, Deep Dive program participants yeah. for a bit. Uh, uh, if you learn uh, about the participants' uh, profile, mm -hmm. about their personalities, about the uh, work that they do, startups that they uh, trying to bring to, uh, uh, put together, uh, what do you think are the typical like top three mistakes that they do? Um, uh, customers, customers, customers. Um, and, and I mean, and maybe it's a residue of uh, old Russia, but uh, uh, kind of this command and control of, um, uh, attitude of, um, you know, I know best and therefore I will build the product and people will do as I say. Um, and, and uh, you know, maybe there's some part of Russia where there's that, that still works, but, but it's this kind of hybrid capitalist system. No, no, they don't have to buy your product anymore. So, so welcome to capitalism. You actually need to build things that people want to use. Um, and we're used to that here in the States. And I, and I find it very um, I, I, both amusing and happy to watch uh, Russians learn this as well. It, it, it will because mm -hmm. in capitalism, people vote by not buying your product. Um, you can't mandate the product. Mm -hmm. You can't say this is the one tube of toothpaste that you now get. <laughs> and especially with uh, Android and iPhone apps, you will have thousands or ten thousands choices. Mm -hmm. and now the question is, did you build something that matched people's passion or heart or needs? And you cannot do that by telling me how smart you are. Mm -hmm. Worse, you can't tell me about how much money you raised. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter. It just mm -hmm. means that you found an idiot a as a venture capitalist, um, which Russia has uh, uh, an enormous uh, <laughs> amount because there's a lot of dumb money in the first wave of venture capital. Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, talking about fundraising, yep. uh, uh, there will be two questions. One yep. question is... Uh, Compared with uh, like year 2000 or 10, 10 years ago, so um, let's say when I came to the United States and first time I visited Silicon Valley, I was like, oh, that's a place you just stay on one-on-one -on -one with like a sign, I'm, yeah. I'm a startup and uh, investors will drive around, they just uh, write a check and throw it out there. Uh, I was wrong and uh, uh, still, it was easier, much easier. There were less expectations to raise money, um, and but now it's uh, it looks like it's a very fierce competition. You have to have so many metrics to even raise five hundred thousand dollars. What has changed, and and why it's going on? Uh, what are the reasons other than the cost of getting this built? So in the built? last bubble, what happened was we could achieve liquidity. That is, if you were an investor, you could take the company public by just having the word E or I, you know, internet or, or something, in front of the name. Because remember, uh, uh, during a bubble, investors aren't building companies, they're actually being financial engineers. All they care about is can they get a liquidity event. When the bubble crashed, uh, venture capitalists needed to go back to what they used to know how to do, which is teaching entrepreneurs actually how to build companies. Mm -hmm. That's different from building financial events. Is that distinction clear? Yeah. Right. So, so if you need to build a company, well, to last for the long term, oh, instead of worrying about how do I take this public or how do I merge it, you now have to understand how do I get profitable? Oh, and then work backwards from that. Mm -hmm. Profitable, I need customers. Instead of needing Wall Street, right, I now need customers. Well, how do I get customers? And so we had to go learn the first principles yet again in a new environment, which is mobile apps, web apps, cloud apps, about how do you build profitable businesses over time, rather than how do I just mm -hmm. exploit the stupidity of Wall Street at the, at the time to buy anything that had mm -hmm. uh, internet in it. Does that? Yes, uh, but could you comment, uh, add something on the expectations of investors? Yeah. Uh, so, so, so nowadays, at least here in the Silicon Valley, showing up with here's my idea, or here's my plan, is no longer good enough. Um, because investors are finally admitting they really don't read business plans. Um, and worse, business plans are a single point in time. They're a static, in fact, I have smart students at Stanford, they could go write you the world's best business plan in a weekend in the library. But that really is no indication of do they actually know anything. Uh, what you really want to hear about, I think, is their journey. 
Here was my original idea. Here's who the customers were. Here's what I, and so here's my idea. Here's what I did. Then here's what happened. No one came to the site. So here's what I did. I changed this, I changed that. And oh, I got tons of people at the site, but no one activated. Okay, I got you know, lots of activation, but I figured out how to free me a model, but no one was upgrading. And, and maybe you tell that story very quickly, three or four times, and then until you finally get, but now I have 10,000 users and I'm gaining you know, 5,000 users a week. And I'm here because I need some money for scale. Boy, that's a much interesting story, much more than here's my idea. <laughs> now, you tell me which one's going to get funded. So I think the level of sophistication of investors about tell me about what you've learned, and it's not just the metrics, tell me how you got here. Because if you're going to tell me you were a genius from day one, you're simply lying to yourself and me. No one does that. Or, or if, if you're the rare one out of a million who do that, then a bag of money is going to fall by your feet as well. <laughs> if you're a normal person, you have been on a journey. And it's the journey that we really need to hear because it will tell us a lot about how quickly you learn, what you're learning, are you on the right trajectory, etc. So the level of sophistication of VC, here's what I want to hear, is much different than mm -hmm. here's my idea, give me $50,000. Mm -hmm. All right, yeah, that makes sense. Um, have you ever thought about how this aspect of uh, entrepreneurs versus investors will look like, uh, this relationship will look like, let's say, 10 years from now? Yeah, um, you know, it's, it's very interesting. Uh, venture capital in Silicon Valley has undergone um, a fairly radical set of transitions in the last 30 years. It used to be in the late 1960s and the 70s when, when venture capital emerged as a business, they invested in things with electrons. By electrons, I mean silicon or computers or whatever. In 1980, a company called Genentech went public, which was the first life sciences company. And all of a sudden, venture capital bifurcated, split. You had the guys who invested in electrons, and now you had the guys who invested in cells, living things. While they, some of them might still have stayed under the same roof, the same company, these people did not go back and forth. You weren't one day investing in a silicon mm -hmm. company and the next day knowing about Amgen. Uh, it, very rarely, but, but, but those were distinct uh, expertise. It wasn't until about 2002 that there was another partial split, and that was um, uh, clean tech investments. Yeah, you could say some of those electron guys understood, but the capital requirements were different, the regulatory requirements were different, so there were some investors who kind of focused on clean tech. And, but in the last five years, something even more exciting has happened. To the, so, so what happened in the last five years for venture capital is really interesting, is that the uh, venture capital community split once again, is that startups in web, mobile, and cloud no longer need millions of dollars. And they move at uh, speeds that are 10x faster than traditional VCs were used to dealing with. So a whole new class of VCs emerged, super angels, that could deal with $100,000 investments rather than needing to put, you know, four, five, ten million dollars at work because they have a billion dollar fund. And so that changed the venture community one more time. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what do you think about this uh, uh, community uh, profile ten years from now? It, it's, it's, it's interesting. I, I think uh, venture capital will continue to emerge as startups continue to emerge. You know, venture capital was just reacting to the fact that web, mobile, and cloud were a new class of activities that didn't quite match the traditional investment mm -hmm. activities. And I think we'll see um, changes I can't even predict. Like maybe like a billion dollar fund that would uh, throw money away just on a very simple qualification? No, I think more like uh, Kickstarter and uh, crowdsourcing uh, mm -hmm. is a potential. Um, I think uh, it's interesting why Combinator uh, experimenting on the fact that we don't even care about your idea, we're just funding teams. Mm -hmm. uh, those are nice science experiments. And, and which ones of those experiments a actually turn into hard data? And mm -hmm. uh, We don't know, but I, I, I just want to point out, we're experimenting a lot here. The Valley is a continual experiment. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, um, Mr. Blank, thank you very much. Thank it was a pleasure to have you, and best of luck with your uh, future endeavors. All right. Uh, best of luck to you. Thank, thank you. you.